Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn. And in this episode, I'm talking to Nick Jobber about the momentary encounters that bring a journey to life. We talk about how religion weaves its way into travel, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, and how sometimes we can sense the intensity of faith even when we are not religious ourselves. Nick talks about the nomadic life and the attraction of desert places, finding the roots of fairy tale across Europe, and how travel is changing, even while our desire to explore remains. So I hope you enjoy the interview with Nick today. Nicholas Jubber is the award-winning author of five travel books, including Epic Continent and the Timbuktu School of Nomads. His latest book is The Fairy Tellers, a journey into the secret history of fairy tales. So welcome, Nick. Oh, thanks, Jana. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you about lots of things. But let's start with the latest book. So just a, a quote from The Fairy Tellers. Grow up in suburbia and either you tend to stick it out or you spend your life looking for ways to flee those privet hedges and cul-de-sacs. And I read that line. I was like, oh, yeah. (laughs) So tell us a bit more about you and how you became a travel writer from that background. Oh, gosh. Well, yeah. So I, I grew up in a very typical sort of middle class kind of lifestyle. And I think that there was this part of me that wanted to break out of there. I think that for me, travel is often driven by a combination of a sort of escapism and curiosity. And I think that from growing up sort of in the cul-de-sac and then I went to a, a, a boarding school run by monks. And then I worked after university in a, in a job where I was working with a lot of filing cabinets and doing Excel spreadsheets. And I was utterly bored out of my mind and constantly reading about faraway places. And then an opportunity came to teach in Jerusalem at a school in the old city of Jerusalem. And I I thought that would just be fantastic. So so I went along there and sort of carried on traveling really ever since. And it was a fascinating time to be in Jerusalem. The Intifada had broken out. There was a terrible time. They were fighting on the streets, but there there was a real sense of history in the making and debate about about what what was going on and and, and the world as we were moving into the 21st century. So a sense of, of a really exciting time to be traveling in that particular region in the Middle East. And that led me to, to traveling to different places around there, Jordan, Syria, Egypt, and all the way down to Ethiopia, which ended up in my first book, The Prester Quest. And then from there, more journeys. You know, as soon as you start traveling, you start you see different places that you want to go to. And, and I think, oh, I want to go to Iran now. I want to go to Afghanistan. I want to go to Central Asia. I want to go to India. And so it just snowballed on and on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's so interesting because we have had some overlap in our, uh, we were both at Oxford, similar, like one year overlap, I think we we came up with. But I think we were also maybe in Jerusalem at a similar time. <laughs> oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Because <laughs> I also worked out in Jerusalem and, well, the West Bank uh, as well during sort of intifada times. Of course, there's been multiple intifadas. Yeah. But, but um, well, let's get into the press request and then come back to the fairy tellers because I'm, you know, fascinated by this myth of Prester John and it as you say it goes into Africa and, and, and around mm. the Middle East so how and also you said you went to a boarding school run by monks so how has religion underpinned your travels and wound its way into your writing fascinations? Well I suppose I grew up in quite a religious household sort of Irish Catholic background and so ch- going to church is something that was very much part of my life at the same time because I went to a, a school run by monks and they were you know as with many of those schools it led to various issues and scandals so so I'm sort of very aware of the flaws of of religion as well as its power and so I think I have quite an ambiguous relationship with that and I, I think actually the going to Jerusalem really exacerbated that because you see the incredible power that religion has on people and and 
and its, its ability to join people together, but also obviously to split people apart. And when you'd see the violence and the vindictiveness with which people treated each other because of their religion and continue to do so, and that can be really, uh, really horrifying. And as, as you know, the number of times in the West Bank or, or in Jerusalem or in, in Bethlehem or wherever that I, you know, I suddenly have my eyes stung by tear gas or, or or even be hit by stones and see these battles going on with very young people. I mean, I was working in a school and we'd have uh, kids coming into school suddenly on crutches or with or with wounds and they'd, they'd come out with all sorts of excuses. They'd say, you know, oh, I, I fell down the stairs, sir, and all that kind of rubbish. But we all knew that they'd been out fighting in the Intifada because they wanted to take their take part in that and that was not just religious it's it's to do with nationalism and to do with all sorts of all sorts of issues but obviously religion in that part of the world plays a very key role so what about i mean you mentioned violence there but one of my impressions of iran i haven't been there i'd love to travel in iran one of my impressions is that we might think there's religious fundamentalism which of course there is but there's also this sort of openness and there's loads of other religions in a, a country like iran i watched a documentary on the christian community but also you've got all just all kinds of really interesting things going on and so, so often it's stereotypes of these countries that come up when we talk about religion. But how have you seen beyond those stereotypes in your books? Well, Iran, I mean, Iran was a, was a fascinating one because obviously there was this, there's this sort of very monolithic impression that is often given to the outside world of Iran. And then you get in there and you find this incredible hospitality. And that, that is, comes out partly of Islam and and partly of other other beliefs as well and other traditions there's the Zoroastrian faith there in in Yazd and I found it fascinating to meet some of the Zoroastrians and and to to hear about how that religion continues and how a lot of younger people in Iran even if they've been brought up as Muslims feel a connection to that sort of old the old Iranian faith but also meeting you mentioned the Christians I mean I remember having a lovely time when I was in Isfahan and uh, I'd been in Iran for quite a while and I guess I hadn't had an alcoholic drink for a while and then suddenly this um, an Armenian Christian invited me to come into his his compound where they were brewing their own arak and, and invited me to sit down and I have a very hazy memory of of the rest of that day but I remember <laughs> it being you know tremendously warm-hearted and feeling very welcomed and but really throughout Iran I felt this tremendous sense of welcome and people say there's a phrase where they say that the guest is second to God so it does come out of that religious belief but at the same time you also see the sort of the oppression with which re- religion was used against people and how people's lives and opportunities were being stifled by it and I met a lot of people of all all kinds but especially a lot of sort of poets and painters and, and actors who would be fighting against the mullah's regime and fighting against that sort of very blanketing oppressive form of islam and and try to celebrate life which in itself was a form in iran can be a form of rebellion and that was really uh, really uplifting actually and then that traveled into into going to afghanistan as well and and meeting people from of, of, with various backgrounds i mean i remember spending time amongst the sufis of herat when they were performing the the zikr where they're uh, reciting the name of god uh, very very uh, very quickly and repetitively to connect themselves with god and the i was really enchanted by the humility and the power of faith that that, that some people had there especially people who are living in really fraught and 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 tense and difficult circumstances and sometimes faith would would have that it faith could be the thing that i guess helps people through i mean i found that myself traveling in afghanistan that my faith suddenly started increasing enormously as i found myself going into places like helmand and those more dangerous places and i I'd, I'd suddenly start praying again as as i hadn't really for many years which um admittedly was probably quite superficial but it you know it's, <laughs> i guess to to do with that sense of danger around you and wanting some kind of branch that you can hold on to Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm always fascinated by religion versus faith, what you're saying there, but also spiritual moments, which I felt I don't I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in any particular religion myself, but I have had these spiritual moments where I'm just suddenly aware that there is more than just our physical world. There, There is something else (laughs) and places where I feel like spiritual intensity is strong and that might be in a man-made environment like amazing architecture but also in nature so I wondered given that you said there you you were praying in that moment but it doesn't sound so much a spiritual moment but what are there places that you've been on your travels where you've thought yes there this means something in some way 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's often actually when you get away from the crowd. So I think sometimes there are these, there are, can be these sort of wonderful moments where you take part in a, a, a religious ceremony. I mean, in places like Jerusalem or Rome, when you're in Rome and the Pope's giving his blessing, it does feel wonderful to be part of this big crowd. But actually, I think the moments, I'm not sure if that's necessarily spiritual. I think it's often when you're in I found when I'd been on my own somewhere and I remember being in in the ruins of Arni, which is in southeast Turkey on the Armenian border. And it's an old sort of medieval uh, Armenian town when there was these beautiful churches with sort of rocket shaped steeples. And you'd walk into them and there are these medieval frescoes that have survived. They're quite pale and, and peeling away and lots of holes in the roofs and the wildlife is sort of half kind of retaken, reclaimed the the architecture. And standing there, seeing the light coming through these holes in the roof and and feeling yourself just alone with the vision of the medieval painters and seeing the biblical stories told through these medieval painters, that sense of transcendence that you're almost traveling through some kind of wormhole back in time. I think those are the kind of moments where I felt really a kind of a sense of connection, a sense of something spiritual. Um, Mm. Or another example, I think, would be in in Iceland. There's a place called the Arctic Henge, which has been built actually just in the last few years in Ralvahofen, in the in, in in the Arctic Circle, very north of Iceland. And it's a sort of giant sundial surrounded by columns and pillars, and they've got the names of of various figures from the Edda, from the old Nordic uh, uh, mythology, inscribed on some of these stones. And that sense of being in this very isolated place, this very cold place, and sort of having that place, not not so much having that place to yourself, but being alone with that place. And I think also that sometimes in these places, even if you're on your own, there's a sense that that sense of kind of emotional connection with anybody else who has been there and has felt something there that these places are often they're sort of repositories of people's feelings we connect i think with with other people's emotions who have come there before us or 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 maybe you're even going to come there after us and that sense that these are places where we we're coming for a common purpose Mm, i agree with you i feel like there are places that just so many people have felt something that it's just become imprinted into the environment somehow but I also you mentioned there the isolation but I also like insignificance I feel like travel makes us feel insignificant in a good way like okay I don't need like everything's not so important because I'm just this tiny speck on the world and you write about the desert which I love and I enjoyed the Timbuktu school of nomads and uh, I still remember first seeing the Sahara from the cockpit of a 747 as we flew to live in Malawi when I was a child and it's one of my kind of my first memories is, yeah. is the desert of course they don't let children in the cockpit of planes no. anymore <laughs> so you got to go into the cockpit that, that must yeah. have been great it was it was one of those yeah. sort of you know it was like 1982 or something and back then you, oh, you could wow. smoke on a plane let alone yes. <laughs> just wander around yeah. but, but you've obviously you've traveled in the Sahara and it feels like there's this romantic view which I definitely have I don't want to live in the desert for sure but what's the sort of romance for you and what's also the reality yeah, well, I had this wonderful sort of romantic vision of the desert and I knew that it was it was a, a, an illusion. And so I wanted to find out the truth of it. Really. I'd grown up with all those sort of wonderful films like Lawrence of Arabia. And so I had that sort of the images of the desert from Star Wars movies. So. So I was very aware that that was an idealized and 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 romanticized image. And I was really curious to know what is it like for the people who actually live in the desert? And that was really the the spur for for the Timbuktu School for Nomads. When I went out there, inevitably, I found that it's just so much more complicated. I loved the wildness, the danger, the the sense that you're very much at at one with nature. There are no safety nets. And at the same time, the discipline of survival, being amongst the amongst nomadic people and just seeing the amount of, of craft and skill and technique that they have and the absolute necessity of following those techniques all the time really is quite regimental. It's, it's almost like a military life. But at the same time, there's sort of wonderful camaraderie when you sit around the campfire, when you've walked for hours across this very hard desert, the heat baking your back and then finally you get to sit down and you will slump and 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 build this fire and there'd often be these wonderful traditions around rituals around the tea making which i think as a brit i really connected with <laughs> yeah um, so you have this sort of very 
complicated process of tea making. And, and I remember the, the, the sort of pride I felt when I learned to make the tea myself. And they said, yes, you've done it right this time at last. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, I grew to really admire and respect the, some of the nomads who I traveled with. And there, it's a very austere life and it's not for everybody. And I think that was one of the things I learned as well was that there are people who thrive in that life, but there are people who don't. And you see the people who want to get away from that life and sometimes aren't able to. And sometimes they do. And then sometimes they come back. You know, life's complicated. So it was really interesting to see all, all that sort of complexity and, and to see the, very, the many different ways in which people live in the desert as well. I traveled amongst camel herders, but also amongst uh, people who, who keep goats and uh, or cattle. And then also in different parts of, of that area of North Africa amongst people who, who go fishing on the Niger River as well. So there was a range of lifestyles and and I I found all that really, yeah, just really fascinating. Mm. And of course, it's a school for nomads and you include lessons in it. Yeah. But when you came away, what sticks in your mind is sort of the main thing you learned for yourself and your own personal development out of the desert and that nomad life? Well, I think I learned a lot about that sort of focus, really, of when you're traveling, you have to keep your eye on the prize, know exactly what you're what you want to do. And I think that a lot of the, the nomads who, who make their lifestyle work, they're not distracted. They're they're very disciplined and they're very focused on exactly what whatever their task is, whatever they need to do. So I think I really learned to to admire them for that sort of that the way they they strip out the complex, you know, too too much of the sort of the distractions and 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 annoyances and, and make sure that they're very targeted. And I think I learned a lot about being with people, actually. One of the things that I love to for, with traveling really is meeting people who have all sorts of different ways of life. I've often not found it easy to necessarily just sort of sit down and uh, just do the sort of chitter chatter that that actually is really very much a part of of nomadic life you know you get to the end of your your day or your night sometimes you'll be walking at night and then it will be around dawn that you you eventually rest and you you sit around and and relish each other's company and I, I think that was probably my most abiding memory of of that experience and then the the city of Timbuktu because I feel like the name is so evocative of myth and legend but what is that city really like? Oh it's an amazing place and then an incredibly downtrodden place in so many ways I mean it's very much a city on the edge it's it's fame really is because it's between the desert and then the the it's it's between the Sahara and sub-Sahara and the the world of the river and the desert come together there and so it was this great sort of trading entrepot but it was never um you know it it had moments in history where it was quite wealthy Mansa Musa the wealthiest man in history um was uh, ruled over there at one point but I visited there several times, actually, both before and after it had been invaded by the Islamic Jihad group. It was really heartbreaking to see what happened to the city and what the people of the city went through. You know, when I came back the last time and I met people who had stories about you know, friends of theirs who'd had their hands cut off for stealing a bag of rice, or I met a young woman who had been whipped a hundred times on the back because she'd met her boyfriend in the street. So the city had been through a real trauma and it was a little bit broken, I think. But I was also really amazed by the resilience of the people. I mean, one of the people I met was a man called um, Abdul Qaeda Hadera, who was a librarian who had been involved in and very much a pivotal role in organising the, the movement of manuscripts out of Timbuktu. They have these amazing medieval manuscripts which go into all kinds of subjects, not just religious subjects, but also pharmacology and astronomy and all kinds of the wonderful sort of a range of subjects that medieval scholarship produced. And a lot of these books they they knew would be targeted by the jihadists so they moved them all and got them onto the river and, and moved them out 370,000 manuscripts which they managed to transport to Bamako so it was amazing to hear some of these stories of how people had survived and how they had managed to endure and their defiance and I think one of my most wonderful memories in Timbuktu was going to a wedding party going on the back of a friend's motorbike and we just sped through the alleys to this little house and on a back alley and the light suddenly flaring around us everybody out dancing sort of wonderful headdresses and coiffures and 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 the joy of of music and dance and that sense of of a city that was coming out of a terrible time and was determined to celebrate life and to enjoy it as much as they could Mm. and uh, I think that's always going to be my sort of you know most sort of poignant and abiding memory of that amazing city. 
Yes, and I've actually I've read that book, The Book Smugglers of Timbuktu. That's a great book about exactly what you're talking about, about getting the manuscripts out of the city. And uh, yeah, again, I think we have these stereotypes of places. And I had no idea before reading that book that there were these manuscripts there. And I, I think often people don't know, for example, that Ethiopia had this incredibly powerful civilization and rich civilization. And so it's interesting, isn't it, how the how we come up against these modern stereotypes of things because of media. And then we have to break those down when we travel or we don't see what yeah. places are really. Absolutely. Well Africa has particularly been very badly served by Western historian scholarship and media. And, and so I think that we have this sort of blindness really to the richness of the continent. You mentioned Ethiopia. I mean, that was the richness of Ethiopian culture is one of the reasons why the myth of Prester John uh, connected with, with Ethiopia. And so when I was traveling to in, in, in the wake of the Prester John legend that Ethiopia was my ultimate destination, going to this amazing town called Lalabela where they have these rock cut churches and it's absolutely architectural gem. And as you say, they have these amazing manuscripts and incredible sort of texts and versions of biblical stories. And you know, just a huge, a huge richness of culture, which is really fascinating to delve into. But it's interesting. You mentioned Lalibela that I I looked at, I wanted to go to Ethiopia. I've written about the Ark of the Covenant in one of my novels, yeah, and right. they have something that could be <laughs> the Ark in yeah. Ethiopia. And they, they uh, say they have it. Yeah, they say they, they have it. it. <laughs> exactly. But it's interesting because when I looked at going, there was quite a lot of of violence going on. And I mean, you've mentioned some of the dangers of travel and I mainly travel as a solo woman. And so I'm pretty yeah. careful about the things I do. So I couldn't see myself traveling with necessarily a nomadic tribe in the Sahara. I just, I necessarily wouldn't feel safe that way. So I wonder how you assess your risk, your personal risk, both how I guess you used to when you were a single young man, but now you have a family. And I wondered, like, how has your assessment of risk changed? And do we overestimate the risk, I guess, with travel? <laughs> yeah, well, it's tricky. I think everybody has to, you know, you have to do your research, really. I think you have to do your sort of due diligence and look into it as much as possible. And I think that the, probably the two scariest places I've travelled to were Afghanistan and and Mali, and that, particularly when Mali was uh, uh, going through a war. So I obviously did a lot of research and, and made contact with a lot of people, but there is always that leap of faith where you've got to just, you just got to go and hope that everything works out and trust in the kindness of strangers so that people will be, you know, hopefully hospitable to you. I think it's partly about trying to learn as much of the local languages, as much about the local culture, and really just try to show people that you're there in good faith. Um, you know, that you're not there to prospect for oil or to find diamonds, but you're there because you love their culture and want to learn more about it. And I found that that could be really helpful. But at the same time, you know, there are bad people everywhere. And unfortunately, there are very good people as well. And I guess that in traveling, I've been lucky enough to mostly come across the good people. But I've definitely had my moments where it has felt very dangerous. Obviously, with traveling with children, I mean, those are not places that I would take my children. And uh, so the journeys that, that I do as that we do as a family are very different they're very chaotic in their own way I guess they don't have the same spontaneity that those um solo travels can have and I think that's what I got the impression that the fairy tellers was also partly because of your family you travel you went on a family trip and got an idea that way is, is that right mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've done quite a bit of traveling as a family. So it's really good for sort of shaking ideas up and seeing different places. And obviously, fairy tales is something that's very come out of come out for me of telling fairy tales to my children. So just seeing their reactions to different fairy tales has been really instructive and seeing how different characters in fairy tales really connect with them. And it's amazing, I think, when you you look at some of these fairy tales that go back for hundreds of years and the fact that children still still respond to them in in very often very very interactive and often very surprising ways. And I'm super fascinated in the darkness of real fairy tales. I feel yeah. like we clean a lot of them up now, yeah. but if you Absolutely. actually read some of them, they are pretty dark, aren't they? Tell us about some of the darker fairy tales oh that were fascinating. God. I mean, they're so grisly. The further back you go, if you go back to the original 
some of the original versions then they seem to get darker and darker um, I mean the Grimm's fairy tales obviously are very famous and they've been really watered down and cleaned up as you say by Disney especially but uh, you go back to the original versions and yeah, it all gets much more violent I mean an example would be the, the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs a sort of classic tale in the original version the Queen isn't Snow White's stepmother she's her own mother and she wants Snow White to be killed so that she could eat her heart and her organs and therefore absorb her beauty. So it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty sickening, really, <laughs> pretty horrific. And you find that in so many of these stories. It's part of what makes them so exciting to read in these earlier versions. It's, so that's, that's the startling horror of them. Yeah, I totally agree. And and I I think that we try and shield children from darkness, but equally those stories are kind of important for the darkness because the world is dark in many ways. And so, but I the sort of good tends to overcome evil in the end, which is the, yeah. why I particularly am attracted to reading horror and darker stories because I like good to triumph over over the bad stuff, um, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, don't read too much of Hans Christian Andersen then. <laughs> You've but got um, a lot of sad endings. Yeah. So you did in the fairy tellers again. I've got another quote here. You say stories are cooked in specific places. However universal the ingredients, the recipe carries a local flavor. Which again, there are some stories that repeat themselves over places. But what were some of the places and stories you thought particularly stood out in in the travels for this book? Oh well, I mean, one of my favorite journeys that I did for this one was going to Lapland and I traveled in in the world of Hans Christian Andersen so I went to Denmark and I visited his home in 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 Odense and it was amazing to see the, the poverty that he grew up in and then how he he became this this wonderfully popular and beloved author but I was particularly taken by I've always all well, my life really loved his story of the snow queen I've loved that idea of the, the story of the girl who sets out to rescue her friend to to, to bring her friend back home and so I traveled to Lapland in the wake of that story and I stayed in a snow castle, actually, um, that gets built annually in, on the uh, Bothnian Gulf in Kemi. And I met reindeer herders as well and, and went out on the snowmobile to the glades where the reindeer are, are, are herded and, and saw you know, the challenges of the life of, of reindeer herding. So I, I was really, really sort of enjoyed that, that aspect of connecting that story and, and that particular storyteller with those places and that very sort of uh, Scandinavian, very Nordic world, very cold, obviously, and the very very particular climate and seeing how how that story grew out of that climate which which yeah was really really fun and really exciting to witness what about european cities because you talk a lot about the places that are not so mm. busy but i feel like europe in particular our, our history and our, our present is so dense in some great cities that have been around for so long were there any stories that you found in particular cities well, Naples is really connected with our earliest fairy tale collection, actually, the Tale of Tales, which was set down in the 17th century by a brilliant storyteller called Gian Battista Basile. And he was a, a sort of adventuring courtier poet who traveled from one court to another his his sister was the greatest uh, diva in in opera of the time and she sang for monte verdi the great composer composed music for her she sang for the dukes of mantua and he followed her coattails and he found himself in different courts in avellino in mantua and ended up in gugliano then mount vesuvius erupted and he caught a lung infection and died so he had a very sort of rambunctious life he, he was a soldier in, in crete at one point fighting against the ottoman turks but he also collected stories and he collected the earliest version of cinderella in europe or the earliest full version where she's cenerentola um, the, the, the earliest the full version that we have of, of Rapunzel, um, versions of Sleeping Beauty and many other very famous stories. And he he lived a lot of his life in Naples and he brings out his love of Naples, but also his sort of um, complex relationship with, with Naples as a very loud, noisy, chaotic city. It was the most popular city in Europe of the time. So he, he brings out the wonderful lines where he talks about, beloved Naples, I love the city. But then um, there's also a lot of bitterness about the the corruption of the courts uh, lines about people's hopes all being sent to the winds often you have to go out from the courts out from the cities into the forest where the ogres live in a lot of the italian tales the, the, the forests are, are populated by ogres especially and the ogres often are the wisest people around they're the ones who are often pointing at the cities and the courts and saying oh they're all hypocrites there it's out here that everybody's honest so uh, <laughs> You know, it, yeah it really brings out that um, wonderful sense of that contrast between courtly life and rural life 
That's so interesting. And I agree with that. I mean, it's, we talk about risk earlier. I had one of those experiences in Naples where I felt very unsafe. And it's so funny because you travel in all kinds of places and you feel fine. Like you say, you meet nice people. And it was in Naples where I was like, mm, I am not happy right now. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter, does it, no. where we go? It, it depends on a situation. It depends on how we're feeling. And as but as you say, then I went out of the city and went into the that countryside around there and the volcano and all of that and it's like oh I feel quite happy out here so tapping into that instinct I think is so important that's basically what the ogres would have warned you yeah (laughs) yeah that's what's so funny and that was written however long ago don't go into that city yeah just stay out here in the forest with us uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the landscape around Naples, the, the Campanian landscape, then going down into Basilicata, it's really beautiful. And you have those sort of fumaroles of smoke coming out through the ground, uh, wonderful forests and obviously orchards and so much, very sort of fruitful area. But obviously Naples itself is, I mean, I love Naples, but it is a, you know, it's a tricky city, isn't it? It's, you know, mm. It's a complex city. For sure, for sure. Now, I also, so coming back to children and thinking about the future, I mean, we live an interesting time. <laughs> We've Obviously, we yeah, as we record just... this, <laughs> we record this in uh, spring of 2022. We've kind of come out of a pandemic when we haven't been able to travel and you know, people like us want to get going again. But also we've yeah. got environmental pressures. We've got geopolitical yeah. things going on. So how do you think your children might travel in a different way uh, to you or have are you thinking about changing the way you travel as well well I think for many years I've been trying to yeah trying to thinking a lot about sustainable travel and it can often feel like a contradiction in terms I mean the most sustainable thing to do really is just to stay at home but if you've got that sort of travel itch it's really hard to break I think the main thing is uh, that I've been practicing for for uh, many years really is trying not trying to not fly as much as possible But obviously, I think everybody has to work out their own version of what they consider to be a kind of ethical way of traveling. And I think it's I think it's mainly about a kind of awareness of the opportunities that we have when we're traveling compared with what opportunities might be available to the people that we're traveling amongst issues of money and and what power that might give us over people who have less. So there are all those kinds of issues. I mean, I'm obviously not a, a, a prophet, so I just cannot really predict what travel will be like in the future i hope my children will get to travel i mean that's the main thing i i i think the world is always changing i hope also that whatever they experience it will be a different world because it's always you know the world is always different i mean obviously there's a lot of things that if we look towards the future that can make us feel very worried and think oh god it's going to be awful and it does feel sometimes like it's harder and harder to have a sort of authentically spontaneous journey in the way that you could in the past. I mean, when I think of some of the journeys I did in my 20s and early 30s, and it feels even now like it's getting harder and harder to do those. But on the other hand, there are places always opening up just as other places are closing down. So even though you might not maybe consider a journey to Russia right now, on the other hand, there are places in the Far East that feel more open now than they have for a very long time. Places in Latin America that feel like they're more accessible now than they've been for quite a while. So I think there's always opportunities in different areas. And it's sort of finding those places where you can travel and can have a really interesting experience and, and connect with people. And there are a lot of things that we can worry about about the world. But I think that that possibility of connection, which for me is probably the most important thing in travel, that moment when you get, have an encounter with somebody along the way and you really make a connection with them and you may stay in touch afterwards you may become friends on facebook or twitter or whatever you may not in a way it doesn't matter you just you have those sort of momentary encounters that can really make a, a, a journey come to life and i hope people will always be able to have that yes and i think those of us who as you say, have the itch to travel, have wanderlust in our soul. We, we're never going to stop. And it, 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 we just can't. And also, I feel like yeah. the world is more more blessed because of that. And we getting to know each other. I mean, I'm my family is all <laughs> intermarried with different cultures and different <laughs> different religions yeah. even so we, we we just we're a sort of united nations family and i i feel that intermarriage yeah. is is the way to bring world peace that's it was one of my missions Maybe, yeah. <laughs> but look this is the books and travel show so what are a few travel books that you love and recommend Ooh, 
Well, if I was to go back to sort of one of the ones that had the most formative influence on me, I guess it's probably Wilfred Thesiger's Arabian Sands, which I remember reading at the age of, oh God, what was it, sort of 19, 20, and just thinking, wow, you know, the idea that this was a true story and that somebody had gone out and had such a deep connection with with people in another place. And I, I love I mean, Thesiger has been stereotyped over the years as a very austere and, and serious sort of humorless man. But actually, the, the figure that comes out to me from that book is somebody who, who, who just really wanted to understand another place and made friends with people there to the point where they all trusted each other in very dangerous circumstances. So it's a book that I, that I admire hugely and I, I really admire the, the depths to which he went to really, uh, really understand the places that he travelled in. Sort of different, you know, I guess, would be something like Isabella Bird's A Lady's Life in the Rocky Mountains, which is a classic of the 19th century travel writing genre. And it, it's very much um, just like Thesiger, Isabella Bird is very much a, somebody of her time but she's also somebody outside of time the fact that she is a as a lone woman went off with a gun in her you know sort of hidden her dress and just rode across the rocky mountains and made friends with cowboys and all kinds of you know ne'er-do-wells and had this confidence about her that she felt that she could do anything and, and did and it's a, sort of a wonderful read she's a she's a wonderful writer so those are a couple. I mean, another book that I found recently when I was researching about the um, about fairy tales was the Book of Travels by Hannah Diab, and this is the the the, the account of an 18th century Syrian traveller, and it was actually only discovered uh, quite recently by a French scholar and uh, only published um, a few years ago. And it's the story of this young man from Syria, from Aleppo, who left Aleppo with a French archaeologist called Paul, Paul Lucas and travelled with him as his translator, his dragoman, across the Levant and then into Africa. And eventually they, they made their way up into Europe and to the court of the Sun King in Versailles, where uh, Hannah presented a pair of desert jaboas at the court. And he was this sort of exotic curiosity for a lot of the uh, princes and princesses of the court. And and he, he spent uh, a long time in Paris he lived through a, through, a, through a period of, of famine and had all sorts of adventures there and eventually came back rather unhappily back home to Aleppo. And it's the story of his journey. I mean, he calls it the Book of Travels. And it's just a fascinating insight into, into travelling from, from a non-Western perspective from, from long ago, something that we don't really have enough accounts like that. And he's such a mercurial, such an honest, candid a storyteller. He, he tells us about the things that he disagrees with. There's one moment where he sees people begging outside a church, a, a soldier begging, and he's very angry to see that until he's warned off by some, one of the police told, you know, oh no, these people, they're given a, a, a military pension, but he feels a lot of sympathy for them. Or there's another moment where he's um, upset to see slave galleys having to um, row the galleys and um, tries to um, complain about that as well. And he's constantly coming up against injustices and trying to speak out against them. So it's a very interesting multi-layered account, I think. Fantastic. So where can people find you and your books online? Oh, uh, so I have a website, which is uh, www.nickjubber.com. And um, I'm also on Twitter at Jubber's Travels and on Instagram, Nick Jubber. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Nick. That was great. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.